Okay, welcome to part three of coffee houses and COVID-19. And so we've talked about why we should worry about airborne disease transmission. We should talk a bit about how the virus itself gets into the air. Now we need to talk about what controls the transmission probability. Just getting into the air is not sufficient. It has to reach a susceptible individual. What controls that? And so what I'd like to focus our attention on here are the two, what I would say are the two main threats for airborne disease transmission in typical small retail situations. And I call them uh, by this uh, name that I think Bill Nazaroff, uh, uh, who's a famous aerosol scientist, uh, coined. He said, plume versus room. And so what do I mean by that? And so I think on the, uh, these pictures kind of indicate that. On the left, I have a picture of a so-called respiratory plume. And so I know that in part two, I really emphasize that you can't see the expiratory particles. So what's this kind of dragon breath looking plume thing here that I'm showing? As I'll talk about here in some detail, the, that image is of the air being emitted. We have some fancy optical techniques to show air, not the particles, but the air. But it gives us some insight on the respiratory plume emitted by people when they cough, or very importantly, when they talk as well. And the key thing about respiratory plumes is that they don't go very far. So they're kind of a short distance up to about six feet. We've heard a lot about the six feet social distancing rule. It's based in large part on images much like this one on the top left showing that it's difficult for a respiratory plume to go much further than that. They're characterized by high concentrations of expiratory particles. Um, they also are characterized by a combination of both of these bigger droplets, again, the ones that you can see in a sneeze or a cough, and these other ones that you can't see, these aerosol particles. And they're really associated with direct kind of person-to-person -person transmission. You know, basically you cough in somebody's face. That's plume transmission. On the right, I have pictures of what we call room transmission. And the longer name would be aerosol spread through the room. And here we're showing a cartoon schematic of that restaurant outbreak in Guangzhou in China. And so here, the aerosol spread is much longer distance, even through multiple rooms. It's characterized by lower concentrations and just aerosol particles. The bigger droplets fall out by gravity much more quickly. But so even though it's lower concentrations than just the aerosol particles, it's been implicated in many large outbreaks. And so now let's talk about these two different threats in detail. So first I'd really like to illustrate how we measure these or visualize these respiratory plumes. And the way people do that is using something called Schlieren photography, which is a very fancy optical technique using mirrors and cameras. And what it does is it shows differences in something called index refraction. The details of that are not super important. The key thing to realize is it's not showing, again, it's not showing respiratory particles it's really showing hot air versus cold air. And so here's a, a great example of Schlieren photography just around a woman who's standing in a typical room. And you can ignore the green versus orange, that's a optical artifact. The key thing is if you look at her, it looks like she's on fire, okay? She's not on fire. She's not emitting perfume or some other weird noxious substance. This is what she looks like in Schlieren photography and what you're seeing is literally just the hot air rising off of her. And so the, the fancy name for this is a human thermal plume. When she turns around, you can see that when she exhales through her nose, there's also hot air coming out from that. That's a nasal respiratory plume. Okay. And if, as I suspect, you're watching this video in an indoor space that is cooler than your body temperature, you can't feel it, but you have similar plumes emitting off of you right now. Right? And so if you had a camera set up to capture this, you could also look at yourself looking like you're on fire. It's just the hot air rising off of your body. And so that's due to your body heat. But as you saw from that woman, she had a nasal thermal plume. You can also look at respiratory plumes associated with coughing. And so here's a nice clip. Um, it was produced by uh, a professor of engineering, uh, Gary Settles, at Pennsylvania State University. And here you can see this really dramatic looking plume. And again, to me, it looks like dragon flames coming out, but it, it's just hot air. It's just the hot air being emitted. But this technique is really nice because it shows how far a respiratory plume can go. What about, that was coughing. 
what about talking? And so here's some work by Julian Tang. And this is actually two individuals. They're not coughing. They're just having a conversation. All right. And you can see the human thermal plumes coming off their heads. But more importantly, you can really see every time they talk, you see this big puff of hot air coming out. And these, these two individuals are standing about one meter apart, about three feet apart, a very typical distance for a face-to-face -face conversation. And here's the perhaps gross thing. You can see that a lot of the exhalations from one individual reach the face of the other person. And so when they inhale, they are literally inhaling air that was in the lungs of the other individual. And so you know from your own personal experience that you might be talking to somebody and you might smell coffee on their breath, or if they had garlic for lunch, you can smell that on their breath. What that means, if you do that, if you smell coffee or whatever on someone's breath, you are literally inhaling air that was in that person's lungs. And as we saw in part two, it, when they're talking especially, that air that they're exhaling also contains these expiratory particles which can carry the virus. So again, let me really emphasize, those movies I'm showing are not the particles, they're not the virus, they're the air. And what you can't see in those movies is the particles themselves. What I'd like to emphasize here is that carried in the air is a mixture of different particle sizes. And a key question is, once they get out in this respiratory plume, what happens to them? Okay. And so here, what I'm showing on this slide are different size particles, uh, not to scale. If I do showed it to scale, the last one would be completely invisible. But here, ranging from one millimeter all the way down to one micron which remember, that's the most common size for particles released by vocalization. And here's a key part of physics. The bigger the objects are, the quicker they fall. Right? And so here what I'm showing are these blue arrows qualitatively represent how quickly they fall. And if you imagine these particles being released from a height of about six feet, you know, standard height of an individual, on the left, a one millimeter object falls like a rock. And so it takes about half a second for it to hit the ground. And that kind of matches your intuition. If you drop a little ball bearing or, or something, it doesn't take very long for it to hit it. Your intuition, though, starts breaking down as objects get smaller and smaller. So something that's a tenth of a millimeter, 100 microns, takes about twice as long, 1.2 seconds. If it's another factor of 10 smaller, 10 microns, it takes almost two minutes for it to hit the ground. And then for the thing that uh, we emit the most of, the one micron particles, that takes, this is not a typo, three hours, three hours for it to hit the ground. And so some of, uh, often when I'm talking about this, people start saying, well, well, wait a second, didn't Galileo do this experiment where he dropped two different size cannonballs off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and they hit the ground at the same time? And the answer is yes, he did do that experiment. In that regime though, the physics is very different because the wind resistance, that drag due to the air, is negligible. For these really small particles, if Galileo had done the experiment not with cannonballs, but with micron scale expiratory particles, he would have gotten a very different result. He would have gotten this result, that it takes a very, very long time for these guys to settle out of the air. Um, and just to really drive this home, if you don't believe that these micron scale particles can float around in the air for such long time periods, do the following experiment. Go get a green laser pointer and go outside at nighttime and to shine it up into the sky. All right. You'll see a green laser beam. Why do you see a green laser beam? You're not actually seeing the laser beam itself. What you're seeing is the light reflected off of these one micron scale particles floating around in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is full of these guys. Different places have different amounts. But in general, you shine the laser, you're going to see them. And they stay up there basically indefinitely. So that was a little bit about the first threat, which is this idea of a respiratory plume. And the key take home message there is if you stand face to face with somebody, you might be right in the middle of that respiratory plume. Now most people are polite and they cover their mouth when they cough or they face away when they cough. The th thing that people don't realize is that, like remember that video of the conversation, you also have respiratory plumes just by talking and people have face to face conversations all the time. That's a great concern if that person is infected. You might not tell because they're asymptomatic but you're breathing stuff directly. So that's the first threat, these respiratory plumes. The second threat is aerosol spread through the room. And this is a much longer distance uh, threat. And so let's, let's think about this in some detail. And first, 
I'd really like to highlight a really important uh, aspect of aerosol spread. And this audience is mostly coffee industry people. I thought this would be great to show a classic television ad which reveals, I think, important physics. When it seems like nothing else will, the fresh mountain grown aroma of Folgers coffee can really get you out of bed. Mm. Just the kids are up. Okay, so you might be wondering, why did I show a Folgers ad? And just to be clear, Folgers is not sponsoring this. If you're old enough, you might remember these commercials. They played widely in the 1980s. And if you're into marketing, you might think this is great. It shows a happy family. You know, if, if you're into tasting coffee, you might be wondering about uh, how the coffee tastes. As an aerosol scientist, I watch this ad, and I think here's the key question. How did this couple get woken up by the smell of coffee all the ways across the house? You know, they're not woken up by their kids playing. They're woken up by the smell of coffee clearly going all the ways from their coffee maker in the kitchen upstairs to their bedroom. How did that aroma get there? Right? And so <clears throat> the short answer is that aromas and expiratory aerosol particles are carried by very weak air currents through indoor environments. And really just to drive this home in a coffee-centric context, here's a picture of a Starbucks in Hong Kong uh, where they've enacted social distancing measures. You see a lot of the tables are taped off. And here's a very simple thought experiment. If this person over here on the left unwrapped something that was smelly, you know, I don't know, a tuna fish sandwich or a box of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, all right, how long would it take for this individual over here, who's about 10 feet away, it looks like, to smell it? And you know from your own experience that actually it doesn't take very long at all, right? If somebody opens some chocolate chip cookies on the other side of the room, eventually you're probably going to smell that. So what's carrying that smell? Well, in the context of uh, cookies are the food, it's all molecules. Um, and so in the context of coffee, if you smell coffee across your house, you're smelling perforyl thiol and all these other different molecules associated with the um, aroma of coffee. And they're carried, again, by these weak air currents. As I showed, these one micron scale expiratory particles, they're much larger than individual aroma molecules, but they're also carried by these very weak air currents. And what that means is we need to think about the air currents in your indoor environment. And so let's zoom in on probably what's the, the best characterized COVID-19 outbreak in a small retail environment. This again is that outbreak in a Chinese restaurant in Guangzhou. And here I'm showing a couple schematics from a preprint by Hugo Li and his colleagues at the University of Hong Kong where they really analyze this outbreak in detail. And so on the left is a floor plan, a top view of the floor plan. And on the right is a 3D rendering. Focusing first on the floor plan on the left, you can see that the index patient, the person who was asymptomatic but infected, is highlighted there in purple. She is sitting at a table in the middle. And the ones that are colored red are the ones who ultimately became infected over the course of just about a little longer than an hour, an hour-long meal. So just a little more than an hour of exposure, and they caught it. Very importantly, they have video evidence showing that the index patient didn't actually interact with the people at the other tables who became infected. So well outside of the respiratory plume. And very strong evidence for aerosol transmission through the room. And so a key feature of this restaurant is it turns out that it was poorly ventilated. And so what do I mean by that? Ventilation, it's a really important word. Ventilation means the rate at which you bring in fresh air. And so on the right, you can see uh, on the 3D rendering, along this wall on the right, there are several little uh, rectangle things. Those are ductless air conditioning units. And so they're mounted on the wall. They're sucking in warm room air, chilling it down, and blowing it back into the room. And so a really important point is that they are not delivering fresh air. They're just recirculating the air inside the room. On the far left of this 3D rendering, there's a couple little circles here. Those were actually some exhaust ducts that happened to be shut on the day in question. And so the only fresh air that was being delivered was over here near the elevator entrance. There's a little red vent here. That was a bathroom vent that was sucking air out and exhausting it out. 
And occasionally the elevator and another door here on the bottom left occasionally opened. And they went and measured from the video, they saw it open on average every couple minutes. And that delivered fresh air. So this room was not very well ventilated. And they went and carefully used tracer gas to analyze how the air spread through this room. And you can see that all the people who were infected up on the top part of the, uh, of the restaurant were in the middle of this recirculatory air conditioning flow. And ultimately, several of them got infected. And so we can see that there, the recirculation uh, looks like it played a huge role in causing those individuals at those tables to become infected. But some of them did, and some of them didn't. So what, what controls that probability? So ultimately, those individuals had to inhale a particle that carried a virus. And so then a really important question is, well, gosh, what's the probability of inhaling a pathogen? And so what I'm showing here is a generalized plot showing that probability of infection as a function of what we call the expected number of pathogens that you inhale. And if you're mathematically inclined, there's an equation there that uh, relates that probability to that number n. If you're not mathematically inclined, just look at the red curve. As n goes towards zero, the probability is zero, and that makes sense. If you don't inhale any pathogens, then the probability is zero. As the number of pathogens you inhale increases, the more likely you are to get infected, right? And so this is a really fancy way of saying you want to minimize that number of pathogens that you inhale. So the question is, well, then what controls n? What controls this number of pathogens? And I'm not going to show many equations in this talk, but here I think this is a really important one. The number of viruses you inhale in well-mixed air, in air that's recirculated like we showed in that uh, schematic, follows this equation right here. And this is not a precise equation, but it has three key terms in it. So n is proportional to q times t over something called ACH. All right, so what do these mean? The first one, t, hopefully this is intuitive, that's the exposure time. So the longer you're exposed to the pathogens, the more pathogens you're likely to inhale. And so hopefully that, that's very intuitive. The second one is q, right? Um, and we use the letter q for historical reasons. But what does it mean physically? That's the virus aerosolization rate. So you can imagine if more virus is being aerosolized, then you're more likely to inhale it. And the expected number n increases. So hopefully that's also intuitive. The third one, which might be less intuitive, is this ACH there in the bottom. And what does that stand for? That stands for a really important concept in indoor air. That stands for the air changes per hour. And here I've got a picture of a uh, HVAC vent, a register, which delivers air, fresh ventilation air, to your indoor environment. And so, as you can see, you want the air changes per hour to be as high as possible. The higher the air changes per hour, the more fresh air you're delivering, the lower the expected number of pathogens you are likely to inhale is. And so let's talk about the air changes per hour in some detail here. And the ACH, the air changes per hour, has two key ingredients in it. And the first one is the room volume. And so here I have a schematic of a characteristic cafe or coffee house called Joe's Coffee. And just to um, remind everybody, what is the room volume? That's going to be the product of the length times the width times the height of your cafe. And so that volume uh, just the product of those three terms. If you know the square footage of your cafe, all you need to do is multiply that square footage by the height up to your ceiling. And that'll give you the volume. So that's the first ingredient. You need to know how big of a space are we ventilating. The second one is much less straightforward, and that's the ventilation flow rate. And based on my informal discussions with coffee house managers, most of them have no idea what their air change per hour is in their indoor space. Um, and why is that? Well, that's because it's usually out of sight, out of mind. But if you look carefully up in your, towards your ceiling, you might see either exposed duct, or you might see behind a false ceiling some duct work that you can't see, but there's something for most indoor spaces delivering fresh air from the HVAC unit. HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Okay. And so typically there's supply air that comes from your central air handler, your, your furnace or your air conditioner, and then there's return air, which sends it back to that unit to recycle part of it and also get fresh air. So that's happening. You might not be aware of it, but it's happening in your indoor space. And so the ventilation flow rate is the second key ingredient. You need to know what, uh, here I'm de denoting it as F, how many cubic feet per hour 
of fresh air are being delivered to your space. Here I've represented that flow rate just with a couple arrows coming in and out, but you need to know that it's not that simple. And so here's a schematic of a characteristic circulatory flow induced by a ventilation. The air in a room, oftentimes you can't feel it, but the air is circulating, moving around. So how do you figure out your flow rate? There's lots of different techniques. Here I have a video just showing one simple technique. Right? Uh, and this fellow in this video is holding something called a wind vane anemometer. An anemometer is uh, something that measures an airspeed. And what you can do, what you can see is it's got a little, basically has a little fan blade that the faster the airflow, the faster the fan rotates and it gives you a measure. So if you're a uh, do-it-yourself type, you can go buy a handheld anemometer. They're $50 to $100. And you can get one of these. You can measure the average speed at each uh, supply register where the fresh air is coming in. You then need to know what the open area of the register is. You know, it might be 50% metal grating, 50% open, all right? You then need to know what fraction of the time the HVAC is actually on. If the fresh air is only flowing half the time, you've got to multiply by half. Then you've got to add it up for all the different registers in your cafe. That might be a lot of work. Another technique, and what I recommend, is you go get an HVAC technician to measure it for you. So once you find out what that flow rate is, you can calculate your ACH, and it's really simple. It's just the quotient. You just take the ratio of that flow rate to the room volume. And here's a very specific example. Let's imagine you have a 1,000 square foot retail space in your cafe. It's got nine foot tall ceilings, so that means you have 9,000 cubic feet of volume in your space. Let's say further that you have three supply vents, and your HVAC technician tells you that each is delivering 100 cubic feet per minute. That's the standard, at least in the United States, that's the standard uh, measure. It's uh, CFM, cubic feet per minute. And that might sound like a lot. That's 300 cubic feet per minute. That sounds like a big number. But when you do the calculation, here you have 300 cubic feet per minute divided by 9,000 cubic feet. And then to get it to air changes per hour, you got to convert it onto an hourly basis. So you multiply by 60. You do the math. You can double check this. You get that this cafe, this hypothetical cafe, has two air changes per hour. And so what that means is that on average, for every hour that you're hanging out in your cafe, the air is completely turned over twice. The next question is, well, is that is two, is that a good number? Is that a low number? How, how, what number should we be aiming for? And I can answer that with a, a couple different ways. The first way is you can look at the time required to remove a cloud of contaminants. For example, let's imagine some angry member of the public comes in your cafe, starts yelling at your you know, staff, sneezes or does whatever, and then leaves. A very simple question is, well, how long is it going to take for all the expiratory particles that guy emitted into your uh, cafe? How long will it take for them to be removed? And so what I'm showing here is that time, the time required to get rid of 99% of the particles that were released by that guy as a function of the air changes per hour. And for our hypothetical cafe here at two air changes per hour, you can see that it's going to take something close to 140 minutes, more than two hours. So that means even if that fellow was in your cafe releasing a cloud of expiratory particles for only 30 seconds, that stuff that he emitted is going to be there in general for about more than two hours. That's a long time. If you increase the air changes per hour, that time decreases dramatically. So if you have 10 air changes per hour, then 99% of those particles are gone within less than half an hour. So in other words, the more air changes per hour, the more fresh air you have coming in, the better for your cafe. The second way you can think about this is going and looking at guidelines. So there's a whole community of people who have thought about indoor air quality for many years. And here on the left, I have a table. This is uh, adapted from CDC guidelines. That's the Center for Disease Control. Um, and it's, they're, they're focused on healthcare situations. And so you can see that different rooms have different recommended minimum numbers of air changes per hour. And you can see in high risk environments like the, the operating room where you do surgeries, they recommend 15 air changes per hour. Bathrooms and food preparation where you're cooking, okay, making a lot of smoke and grease and things like that, they recommend 10 air changes per hour. General labs, six air changes per hour. They recommend for dining rooms, four air changes per hour. And then rooms that have only transient occupancy like corridors or food storage, you know, closets, only two air changes per hour. That's the CDC, that's their guidelines. There's lots of other recommendations out there. Here's something from the National Comfort Institute, which is also tabulated some of this stuff. 
And here you can see in the middle of their chart for restaurants, they recommend much higher ranges for air changes per hour. They recommend eight to 10 air changes per hour for dining areas, uh, kitchens 14 to 18, bars 15 to 20. So the question for our cafe is two air changes per hour sufficient? I would say absolutely not. It's not meeting any minimum recommendations uh, for anybody. That cafe in that example is poorly ventilated. And for, uh, for contrast, that Guangzhou restaurant, the restaurant in China that we focused on, they went back and did some very careful measurements of the actual air change per hour. Um, they actually went and did experiments where they opened the door on purpose every two minutes to get that air change as well. That restaurant was somewhere between 0.56 and 0.7 uh, air changes per hour. So very poorly ventilated. And there's also evidence suggesting, if you recall back in part one, I talked about that choir outbreak. They also had only about one air change per hour. And so that brings us to the end of part three. And just to summarize, what controls the transmission probability? There are two main threats that we're focused on here, were plume versus room. What controls the probability is for plume is how long you spend within the respiratory plume of other individuals. You know, obviously, the more they talk at you or cough at you, the higher the probability of transmission. And the one that's less intuitive is this room transmission, which really depends on your air changes per hour. And in part four, we'll talk in more detail about how to maximize safety in your cafe against both those threats.